the R25 Cancer Education Program that is here at the University of Louisville. And it was founded by the chair of my department, Dr. David Hine. And, um, and it was actually started in 2012. At the time, I was um, invited to participate as a curriculum coordinator. And then after a few years, I was appointed as the uh, co-director, and then we made it official, I think, in, in 2016. It has been an honor working with this, this program and literally kind of like a, a dream come, come true. <laughs> you know how you have that interview and then they ask you, well, how, what do you see yourself doing in five or 10 years? And when I was a fellow at the National Cancer Institute, one of my dreams was to actually help direct a cancer education program. So um, what I'm gonna do is to tell you about our program. And oh, I'm sorry, you guys could not hear anything I was saying. Huh? It was just the last sentence we couldn't hear. We could okay, hear. Okay, good. I'm like, whoa. Um, so I'm really excited to share information about the 10 week summer uh, internship at the University of Louisville. And I'm trying to see if. You muted yourself again, Dr. Kidd. Okay. OK, I think. All right. Mute. OK, this is going to be. If you want to get rid of that window, you can just hit that minimize button on the top next to the end call on the top right of that square that you have. To the right. Yes, there we go. OK. OK. Ooh, I was about to get nervous. OK, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm glad you guys are a lot more advanced than I am. And you would think I would have this down packed by now. Um, the um, the I want to share with you that the the purpose of the R25 cancer education program, which is funded, by the way, by a multimillion dollar grant provided by the National Institute, specifically the National Cancer Institute, and our purpose is to recruit, educate, and motivate both undergraduate and professional students to pursue further training and future careers in cancer research. The duration of the program this year is going to run from May 24th through July 30th. And we take a multi-pronged approach to our program. Number one, you get linked up with a, a with a mentor who's engaged in uh, research in the fields of public health, basic, clinical, or translational research. So even though like you may have a background in public health, you you can still select a mentor who is into basic science research if that's something that you want to explore. We also offer career enhancement and professional development. This is something that's important to me because I know when I was up and coming, you know, the 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 thought of um, like I was told to be able to write a manuscript. I was literally just given a manuscript that was already published, and then I was told, okay go write your manuscript and use this as your guide. And so what we do through our program is that we actually give you um, practical as well as instructional information on the bl blueprint to scientific writing as well as oral presentation. And I'll talk more about that later. And then at the end of the program, we have a culminating experience where you get to disseminate your research to faculty as well as your peers. 
So you may have a question, you know, what is it going to take to actually get selected into the program? Well, every year we have over 100 applications from across the country. So it's a highly competitive program because we only accept anywhere between 30. I think the largest number of students we had was 45 students each summer. Now, prior research experience is preferred, um, but is not mandatory. But you do need to convey in your uh, application that you do have a very strong and compelling interest in cancer research. But I will say that probably over half of our uh, trainees from previous years they actually have uh, prior research experience. We do highly encourage underrepresented minorities to apply in the program. And I would say each year on, on average, we have about 30% um, underrepresented minorities apply to the program, including African Americans and Native Americans. This is a picture of the participants from the class of 2019. That's me to the far left on the first row, blending in with the trainees. And then Dr. Hine is over to the far right. We have a lot of um, faculty mentors. We actually have about 50 faculty mentors that are all listed on our uh, R25 Cancer Education website. And then um, some of the trainees, the, the uh, gentleman in the last row over to your, the, I guess the third from the right, that's um, Chidam. He's, he was actually, he's actually still in the School of Public Health, but working on his bachelor's degree. And he's actually going to graduate this summer. The um, woman in the first row the, uh, at the fourth position inward, she's actually, uh, she was pre-med uh, pre and she's actually going to graduate this May and will uh, likely start at the uh, School of Medicine to work on her, M her, her MD. So it's um, just really exciting to see our trainees just go off and do thing, great things, including going to professional school, uh, starting fellowships. Some are really entrenched in their careers. It's, it's just, uh, just a beautiful program in that regard. So last, um, in 2000, we didn't have the program in 2020 due to COVID-19, but uh, we, in 2019, we had 26 medical students, which was really a record for the program, because normally we only have about 10 medical students. And prob yeah, probably this year we'll have a great number of medical students as well. And then we have 19 um, undergraduate students. But and most of, the, uh, I would say, probably about 85% of them were pre-med students. We select um, students from all over the, um, the United States, including the University of Louisville and um, UK, um, uh, historically black colleges and universities, Emory, um, just a, a nice variety of students from, from all over. Um, for students, I'm not sure, are there any in the audience that have ever participated in the R25 Cancer Education Program other than Mr. Malik? Um, but if you have, you are invited to reapply to the program. Uh, we accept probably a couple of students who were successful in the program before and maybe they want to tie up some loose ends with a previous project. You just have to convey that you've had some level of productivity with your project. And um, then, yeah, we will definitely consider you for a second round. Um, we do have 
um, information on our program. And I'll be sure to send the information, this slide presentation to Malik. We have a website. If you go to louisville.edu and put in the keywords R25 Cancer Education Program, that's another way to pull up in all of the information. It will list all of the alumni of the program, all of the abstracts that they have presented, their posters, it will laundry list their mentors, as well as students who have won uh, poster presentations for their summer research project. And um, that hyperlink below can lead you to more information about the program. The program is a 10 week Pro, a 10 week program, you'll get matched with a faculty mentor, but also I highly encourage you to list within your application, a mentor that whose who's, um, lab you would like to work in, or if you have someone in the School of Public Health, like um, Dr. Bumgart the, uh, Bumgartner's, maybe you could um, speak with them beforehand before you actually apply and you know see if they are receptive to working as your your mentor your faculty mentor in the program they're very familiar with the program and if they can um, work with you to develop a project a summer project that you can work on that would be good for you to include that within your application that you've actually identified a faculty mentor and even if you can get a letter of support for for them from them that would really help you to stand out as an applicant most of our faculty mentor are have affiliations with the james graham brown cancer center um yeah but we do have alliances with the school of public health as well I think what's really what's somewhat unique about our program is that you do have the opportunity to work with your fac faculty mentor to develop your own research project. Of course, within the confinements of their re their overall re research program and their overall goals and, and objectives, but. You know, your the point is is not for you just to be a simple pair of hands in the lab in the laboratory, or um, within the uh, public health realm, but really to take ownership in the project and have some input on the direction of the the research project. At the end of the program, each of the students will have to present their research. And we have two opportunities. One for all of the undergraduates, they have to present at the um, closing summer research poster session. And all of the professional students, as well as the undergraduate students, they can present their research at Research Louisville. For some of our undergraduates who are non U of L students, they can actually assign either a faculty mentor or someone in their laboratory to help represent their their poster. All of the posters are judged by faculty mentors, and um, I mean, I'm sorry, um, faculty sometimes will have postdocs judge the posters as well. And the posters are based on different, the uh, judging are based on different categories, including scientific method, the organization of the poster, the impact that the poster actually has on um, public health related issues or uh, treatment or prevention of disease. The, the presenter's ability to explain their research to um, their uh, to the scientific audience as well as the level of innovation of the of the project 
the posters actually paid for by the R25 Cancer Education Program. So that's not an expense that the interns or their mentors have to worry about. And the um, presenters actually also have an opportunity to win awards. Both them and their faculty mentors can win first, first, second, and third place prizes. Also on our website, you can see all of the, the posters that have won first, second, and third place prizes throughout the, the years. So that's pretty exciting. And these are not um, uh, the, uh, po the pictures that you see to the far right are actually real R former R25 trainees who presented their research to, uh, the, to uh, various faculty members. And the gentleman in the second photo, he was actually in our class of 2012. And he was, man, he just came out of the gate, just really, really inquisitive, always asking questions. He was always engaged throughout all of our activities. And the um, I met him actually at a scientific conference, the annual at, um, American Association for Cancer Research. Uh, and uh, I later learned that he, he applied uh, to our MD program here at the University of Louisville. Here's a summary of some of our 2018 winners for Research Louisville. And first place, we had Keegan Curry, second place, Alana Gibson, and third place, Dara McDougall. And their, their research really spanned the gamut where Keegan, he looked at the development of hybrid lipid polymer nanoparticles architectures for the sustained release of small hydrophilic molecules. Alana focused on targeting breast cancer resistance to palpal sibilant via oncolytic viral therapy. And my mentee actually won third place, Dara McDougall. And her research focused on looking at sequence variants within toll-like receptor-related sequence variants and prostate cancer susceptibility among men of African descent. And it's just so interesting. It turns out like these toll-like receptors, they are proteins that sit out in the membrane of cells, but they some of them are actually within the extracellular um, matrix of cells. And interestingly enough, you know, just to kind of link it back to um, public health, it turns out like, I think it's like toll like receptor nine or something like that, that actually recognizes the COVID-19 um, virus. So I don't know, I just thought that that was um, pretty interesting. Um, Dara McDougall, she actually um, graduated, I think about a year or two year ago. Yeah, I think about a year ago from the um, North Carolina Central University. And she's actually in graduate school now working on her doctorate degree in genetic counseling, but she's not taking the, e the, the easy route, so to speak. She's also engaged in research as she works on her doctorate degree. So this um, is another um, aspect of the R25 Cancer Education Program. So in addition to being engaged in ba either ba uh, population-based basic clinical or translational research with a faculty or lab mentor, you will have professional and career enhancement um, development. And it has four different phases including acquisition of skills, career planning and exploration of cancer research careers, community outreach and engagement, and lastly, cancer research seminars and clinical perspectives. So I'll take you through, through each of these and then dive a little deeper um, 
just to kind of like put some highlight on some of the activities that are near and dear to my heart. In terms of acquisition of skills, you'll have an opportunity to learn about skills that can help you to hone your scientific writing as well as your communication skills. These are just essential to being successful if you know if you want to pursue a well really success um critical to your career as a professional student but even once you you leave and if you decide to remain in public health or go into academia or industry or government you're going to have to have the scientific as well as scientific communication skills like on point. We also have an opportunity for students to actually sit down and talk with faculty who are engaged in clinical basic translational or population based uh, research, but you will also have an opportunity to spend time with your peers that may be one step ahead of you in terms of your, your career path. We do have community outreach engagement, and I'm going to tell you in the, next, in the next few slides about our partnership with the Kentucky African Americans Against Cancer, who not only tell us about community outreach and engagement activities that students can participate in throughout the, the uh, academic year. But I also want to share with you some of the experience of cancer, actual cancer survivors who share their journey with cancer from diagnosis to treatment and the impact that it has on the trainees of our program. We do have weekly seminars that we do in partnership with the, the, can, the James Graham Brown Cancer Center. But um, in 2019, we added another component where actual um, clinicians who are engaged in cancer research, a couple of them you will hear from today, including my colleague, Dr. Robert Martin and Dr. Eggers, they're going to tell you about their research, um, but they do it from just a totally different angle. They actually give you the clinical perspective um, in terms of like how their patients might help to guide their ideas for research and how they actually apply what they gain from their clinical practice into the actual research realm, and then how what they learn from their actual research program, how they can use that to better treat and diagnose their, their patients. So it's, it's, it's really exciting. So I, I did promise you to kind of dive a little deeper into some of the career enhancement and professional development activities. This um, activity is called the 92nd Elevator Pitch Contest. And it came about because I decided to one day attend this, um, it was like a, kind of like a, I call it like a, um, it was like a, it, it was an elevator pitch contest so that nonprofit organizations could compete for uh, fundraising opportunities. Every year, Louisville has like this big fundraising um, where they literally raise like millions of dollars in days for, for nonprofit organizations. So that's kind of like where this um, concept was birthed from. And, and another thing that kind of encouraged it some of our students, I think from 2015, had an opportunity to present their research at the Capitol here in uh, Frankfort, Kentucky. It was a little different because they were really prepared to talk about their research in eight or 10 minutes. 
but there were politicians that literally only had a minute or two to learn about their research before they had to whisk off to another meeting. So just putting those two ideas together, I was like, wouldn't it be nice if we could um, encourage students to prepare a 90 second elevator pitch about their research. And so we decided to do this activity, but do it in two parts. In the first phase, the students have an opportunity to sit at a, in, in small groups, typically about five to six students at each table. And each student has an opportunity to share information about their research, their summer research project to their peers. And so they just do take a round robin approach. Then the peers need to select the student who they believe gave the best presentation. During the second phase, as you can see in this picture on the bottom, all of the students who won at their prospective tables actually have to come to the front and they have to give their 90 second elevator pitch to the entire audience. What we did in 2019, which was different from the previous years when we first launched this, we actually had three faculty mentors that evaluated all of the presenters using a, a matrix. <laughs> and, um, and then the top three is usually, we usually pick about 10, 10 best presenters. And so out of the 10, we select the top three presenters and then present them with just small prizes at the end, just to, you know, just acknowledge their, their efforts. Then we have something that's called navigating careers in, in cancer research. I literally wish we could just do this every week, but it's a big ordeal. We probably spend about a half of almost a half of a day where the students have an opportunity to meet with um, different faculty in or members in, in different fields so that they can get an idea of how to engage in cancer research in, let's say, industry, in public health. And here at the, the bottom left, you can, you'll see Dr. Rob Martin talking with some of the students about cancer research careers in, in medicine. You know, how do you juggle that? How do you juggle a career in medicine and as well as research? And um, then, you know, also careers of obviously in in um, academia. And the students really love this because the faculty, as well as the postdocs and professional students, they are highly in, encouraged to to be ex extremely frank about what it takes to be able to um, pursue a career in, in public health, uh, industry, government, academia, you know, what is it going to take to truly be successful? And we also encourage the students to, to really not only listen, but to also engage in the process because that's the best way to learn. I also wanted to share with you, since community outreach and engagement is really well received in our University of Louisville community, I do want to tell you about our partnership with the Kentucky African Americans Against Cancer. Every year, the Virginia Bradford of the, and the acronym is CAYAC, the Kentucky African Americans Against Cancer. She tell, she um, gives us some amazing information about this cancer survivor or uh, organization that sits under the Kentucky Cancer Program, and that is housed under the James Graham Brown Cancer Center. So, so just connecting all the dots for you. The women, the three women up 
in the top right hand. They are cancer survivors and every year they volunteer to share about their journey of um, of cancer survivorship, starting from the moment that they actually get diagnosed with cancer, consultations with their doctors, the actual treatment, as well as their time or their survivorship after treatment. See, when a person actually gets cancer, like their journey does not end on their last uh, chemotherapy treatment. Some uh, cancer survivors, you know, they still have other issues that they have to deal with. I'm not sure if you could see it really well, but this cancer survivor to the left, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and with breast cancer, sometimes, you know, the um, there may be some concern about the cancer spreading or metastasizing into the lymph nodes. So she actually had to have her lymph nodes removed. And so that causes a chronic issue with lymphedema or swelling. So she has to wear a compression brace on, you know, sleeve on her arm to try to alleviate some of the swelling. The, the, the individual stories are, are just so um, heart uh, touching and it really gave the, the students a, it, it just helped them to make a connect, a emotional connection between the stories of the survivors and the actual research that they were doing in the, in, in the lab or, um, you know, with their, their computers. Cause I know a lot of us in the public health, we're doing a lot of data analysis. So our, our definition of lab is a little different. It just, it gave the, their, the testimonies from the uh, cancer survivors really just gave them um, an idea of actual patients that they may have an opportunity to serve um, somewhere down the line, either as a clinician or, you know, um, for those of us who are in public health, we may also interact with um, patients or community participants through different venues or just these might be individuals that we may either directly or indirectly recruit into studies that we actually um, develop and and actually perform. They just felt that the the testimonies from the cancer survivors, it was just a, a rare opportunity. One of the students said it was amazing to hear the strength and the perseverance that the cancer survivors had to overcome. And it was just very touching to actually hear their stories. It just made you feel like, you know, the research that the students were engaged into the, the summer could ultimately have a huge impact on real people, on real lives. They, the students felt that their stories were so impactful that it made them feel that the, that the research that they were engaged in could really impact the quality of, of life of cancer survivors. Um, it also um, helped um, uh, uh, students who, professional students, it helped them to get an idea of, of um, uh, what doctors actually see um, that, that it helped like the professional students, particularly like the medical and pre-medical students see patients more than just a number or someone that they actually, um, I don't know, it, I don't know, it just helped them to make a better connection with patients that they might serve down in, in, in the future. <laughs> 
You know, like these are real people. They're just, it's just not somebody that you just have to treat, so to speak, <laughs> to get through your day. So I did mention that there is a culminating experience where you will have an opportunity to present your research, not only locally, but you are encouraged to take advantage of travel awards that will give you an opportunity to present your research at regional or even national scientific meetings. Um, these pictures to the far right are examples of student, uh, former trainees that have presented their research locally. And then the gentleman up at the top right, this is the one I was telling you about that act, I just kind of saw him presenting his research at the um, American Association for Cancer Research. I, that was just, um, just really nice to see that. This is just a few examples of some of our trainees who not only engaged in summer research, but they actually had an opportunity to serve as co-authors or authors on publications. And this is really huge. In fact, to date, we have um, like 44 publications um, and um, yeah, so these, and you can actually um, find these on, on PubMed, so I do provide the, the link there. So this might be also really a good way for you to see like which, you know, what, what the different labs are doing. And um, I think this is huge that the students can actually serve as co-authors and in some cases even first authors on, on papers. You'll see that second paper by Mr. Sims, where he worked um, on the efficacy of surface modified PLGA nanoparticles as a function of cervical uh, cancer type. Because this is something that will definitely help set you apart as you pursue um, life after your uh, professional degree and pursue, you know, careers, it's going to really help you to stand out if you can document that you actually served as a co-author or even better, a first author on a published report. So you may have some questions about, okay, what is the time com commitment going to look like? How am I going to be compensated? So I'm going to summarize that really quickly. On average, the students spend about 37.5 hours per week in their, their labs or just working on their population-based studies. Um, and uh, all of the trainees are required to present their research at the end of the summer if you're an uh, undergraduate or if you're a um, professional student, you will present your research at Research Louisville. And the undergraduates can present their, will also have to present their research at Research Louisville, even though they get judged during the summer. The, in terms of all of the career enhancement and professional development activities, that's roughly about one hour per week with the exception of the navigating careers in cancer research. Like I said, that's probably like more like a three or four hour event, but it doesn't feel like that. And in fact, the students always wish that we had more time to engage in that activity. All right, um, let's see. Um, the cancer research and clinical perspective seminars, that's approximately, um, that's, typically one hour, one hour per week. But for the clinical perspective seminars, since those are run directly by us, those are those are just one, one hour. But, you know, we either do, we would either have a clinical perspective seminar or we would have a professional development activity. So. You don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, he's really taking up all our time. Um, 
And since the program has been in existence now for several years, we generally get feedback from the students. So we try to just use the feedback to make the program better. And one of the um, concerns was that, you know, there were some activities that were better suited for professional students, um, whereas others were better suited for the undergraduate students. So when appropriate, we try to tease out those activities so that no one feels that they're getting something that doesn't suit them very well. The, uh, I guess, University of Louisville students are, enc are encouraged to enroll in two credits for um, special projects. This is just an, a research elective course. You don't have to do anything extra for that. It's just that the research activity that you're engaged in, it would just make you eligible to receive credit for this course. Um, and then you don't actually get a grade. It's either, you either get a satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And more than likely, you will get a satisfactory because our students are very, very um, successful within the program. The stipend, I've never seen it so high this year. It's up to $4,750. Plus, there's an extra $1,000 that you and your mentor would get to compensate for lab supplies and also to defray the cost of your poster presentation. The stipend you get at the in two parts at the end of June, and then you get another paycheck um, July 30th. And the money, the funds are deposited directly into your account. I would love to show this video and hopefully it will show up. We actually had WAS 11 come to the University of Louisville to document our program. I hope this will work. And uh, let's see. Can you hear that volume fairly decently? I know it. Not really. Okay. All right. Well, I will skip it, but um, just, I can hear the link in the chat for that. Morning. Yes, it, it really is an outstanding five minute clip that features three of our uh, top trainees um, who are now no longer in the program. They have graduated from the program and all three of them are, are just doing really well in, in their career. One of our trainees who's, who's featured in this first slide, he was actually one of the pioneers of the program in 2012. He repeated the program in that following year in, in 2013. This is Doug, Doug uh, Safaro. I think when he first started, I believe he was um, decided to go to medical school and then later on decided that he wanted to do the master's of, um, I'm sorry, not the master's of public health, but he wanted to do the MD, PhD program. He, re, he last year, he completed the PhD program. Um, so he earned his, his doctorate and then he um, went to go back to finish up the clinical portion of his MD. So I think you do like the first two years of your MD, then you do the um, 
didactic and research portion of your PhD, and then you go back to finish your the clinical aspect. So he's um, really immersed in the, the clinical aspects of his research. Also, one of my former mentees from 2015, he's featured in, in this as well. There's a little short clip of it. <laughs> and But he's doing really great great things and he's um, really immersed in, in his career. So definitely check out that video. It's a really, really nice video. I'd like to um, acknowledge Dr. David Hine, who again is the founding director of the R25 Cancer Education Program. I thank him for believing in me and um, inviting me to uh, serve as a co-director of the program. I'd like to thank all of the, the trainees, including Malik, who has invited me today to present about our program that has been in existence since 2012, 2019. We are taking applications for uh, 2021. The deadline is Febu February 15th. I'd like to, even though I didn't talk about the details of the pro of this particular professional development activity, I do need to acknowledge Dr. Huntington Moscos, who developed one aspect of our uh, communication uh, skills building session. And our program is funded by a National Institute of Health grant. And uh, Mr. Malik will share with you the participant application. You could just click on that, that hyperlink and it will take you there. I will open up. I believe we do have some time for questions. So I will open the floor up for any questions that you may have about the program. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Uh, this is really informative and really helpful for hopefully students that will be encouraged to apply after seeing your really resourceful slides. Um, one question I do have for you is, since we are in a grip of a pandemic, how are the 2021 summer plans looking for the program? That's a very good, very good question. So I'll start with this and say, um, <laughs> the since I would say, I wanna say probably around June for those who do want to engage in basic and clinical or translational research, that seems to be a, a doable possibility. And why? Because researchers are already engaged in research, so they know how to do the social distancing in the lab. I know our building in particular, um, you know, they have hand cleaning stations every, pretty much you know, by every door, by every elevator. There can only be one person in the elevator at a time. There can only be one person in a bathroom at a time. In terms of the actual lab setting, everyone is on a very specific schedule. And, you know, they pretty much try to have as much um, social distancing as possible, pretty much just follow the CDC guidelines. Everyone has to wear a mask. Uh, COVID-19 is, is um, testing is required. Um, you know, of course, as soon as the vaccines become available, people will be able to um, get their, get vaccinated. So that should help as well. We don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but <laughs> Um, our department chair, as well as the dean of the School of Medicine, they really keep us all abreast as, you know, when it is our turn to get vaccinated. The, uh, the great thing about those who are engaged in public health 
I feel like we are at a, a true advantage because a lot of the work that we do, we can do from a computer, which means we can do our work anywhere, including within the comfort of our own home. Whoa, excuse me, sorry. Just give me a second. I don't know if it just, <laughs> oh boy. Wow. Wow. Uh, sorry, I can't find. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, but I, I guess what I want to say is that if you are engage in public health research, more than likely you're going to do a lot of um, data analysis, which you can do from the comfort of your own home. I'm not sure the status of things for those who do more co um, community outreach and engagement in terms of, you know, what you do at the um, public health, but I guess you would just follow whatever guidelines are, are recommended. By, by your specific department in order to stay safe, but still remain productive. Thank you for that, Dr. Kidd. Does anybody else have questions for Dr. Kidd? I guess not. Uh, one more question for you, Dr. Kitt. So how many um, students, so I saw that you had 26 students from medical school and then I think 19 undergrads in 2019 cohort. Uh, I guess my question in that is for 2021, how many do you anticipate coming from School of Public Health? That's a good question. So traditionally we have like one or two students per year. Um, my question to, um, um, with the people who are currently on the call, I'm not sure how many we have, but how many, my questions would be, um, how many are in on the undergraduate level? Or how many are on the professional level? I mean, I'm not, I'm not totally clear on the, the audience that we have, because generally, we have students who are um, either on the college level or um, medical, nursing, dental. There is a precedent for students who are already who already who are about to start the School of Public Health on a professional level. Um, we have accepted students like that as well. So I'm not sure where where the audience is. So if you could um, open up your mic or whatever and sure. just sure. let so, me know um, what your particular, we have a few more minutes before the next. Question. Yeah, so I think it's uh, right now we're looking at mainly graduate students. Uh, but then there may be one or two undergrads from what I'm looking in my uh, participant. Um, but just to, you know, get a better idea of how many we can, you know, how many seats are there for us to apply for and how competitive it's going to be amongst for School of Public Health uh, students. Right. I, to be honest, I believe that we are def this year we are definitely going to give University of Louisville students even more priority 
than we have in previous years. And I, I believe we are also going to give students from the public um, School of Public Health even more priority than we have in previous years due to COVID-19. Um, that's not the only reason why. Again, it's something that's near and dear to my heart um, because this is what I went to school for and this is what I do for a living. So I will definitely vouch for that. In fact, I think earlier on, we were uh, really, really, really interested in partnering with the, the, the School of Public Health. So I believe the chances of you getting in the program are especially high, especially for the undergraduates. And we will, I will have to talk with Dr. Hine regarding professional students who are already in school, um, you know, working on, I'm assuming your, your master's degree or your doctorate degree, what, I'm not sure. Um, so that will, will warrant a discussion with Dr. David Hine. I'm, I will, that I will um, mention to him that, you know, hey, we have professional MDs who are in the, pro who have been in the program. Maybe we can make a provision for those who are currently working on their Masters of Public Health or their Doctorate of Public Health and see if we can loosen some of our criteria for that. I just can't make a promise for that right now. That warrants a discussion with, with Dr. Hine to see if we can open up some slots for that. Sure, absolutely. Thank you once again, Dr. Kidd. Uh, I hope this uh, presentation encourages students to apply for the program as I personally benefited from it. So I would like to see other public uh, health students benefit from this program as well. Definitely. And you can um, either contact myself or Dr. Hahn and our contact information is on that first slide. In fact, just email both of us and either one or both of us will respond if you have any questions. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the, the rest of the presentations today. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. You too.